Toyota Lounge, powered by your local Toyota dealerships. We got AJ, we got Eric, we got Rudo coming to you live, but we're joined by NHL Rules Analyst. Is that the official title? I like Rules Analyst. All right. People call me Ref Expert, but I'm more Rules Analyst. <laughs> rules <laughs> Analyst, Dave Jackson. Not just that, though. You were an NHL ref for nearly 30 years, ref in Olympics. Quite experienced for a, for a referee. Well, as I said last night, I think it was Cassie Campbell said, uh, I, got the, I got one of the calls right, and she said, you know, I don't think Dave's ever wrong. And I told her, well, she's never seen me referee. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. That's awesome. I, l- I love it. I love the reality of that. Uh, first of all, Dave, thank you for, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Obviously, the NHL just a couple of days away from kicking off their playoffs. Uh, you, you make light of yourself, but I'm, I'm curious, in your opinion, what percentage of calls do NHL referees get right? I'd say they get well north of 95 okay. percent of calls right. I mean, and linesmen even more. And unfortunately, what happens is the one call that gets missed is usually a big call, yeah, and it just like a snowball and hits social media, and everybody's talking about how NHL referees miss calls. But I mean, you watch, I watch a lot of games. I get paid to watch 140 games a year, plus my games I watch for fun and. The majority of games go really smooth, and there's not a lot of controversy. I hope, uh, I hope for the ref's sake that there is no controversy in these playoffs when it comes to the calls. <laughs> <laughs> well, for my own, <laughs> for my own selfishness, a little bit of controversy. So <laughs> for I, your, I, I get on the some. air yes, and explain right. some, explain right. some rules. I'm here for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eric, I know you wanted to talk about the the call the other night. Yeah, yeah. The Philly game, uh, puck blown dead, no goal. Just an unfortunate situation. One of the the few percentages where a, a guy gets it wrong, or yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm gonna let you talk about it because yeah. it's fresh. It's just a play yesterday, and then and it's a play that who knows what the outcome would have been, right? But then, and I know what the answer is. I but I want to ask it just for people listening. Like when that happens, like obviously it was Kelly yesterday, right? So yeah, yeah it Kelly, was Kelly yeah. yeah. So when that happens, like, what, what is the help from the other three guys? Like, you know, and then obviously the, the correct call was made because that is the correct call. Yeah. At the end of the day, the outcome's probably not right, correct. but the call is right. Yes. And you can't just change the call. But, you know, so how, how is the help from the other three guys there? Is there something that can be done or the whistle is blown, whistle is blown, and just it is what it is? Well, I, I, I saw that call, you know, my... Twitter feed blew up and Kelly's a dear friend of mine. Yep. Uh, we worked together for a long time and I, I was just dying for him. Um, yeah. You saw his entire crew come in. He blew the whistle. All, all three guys came in. The four of them talked. There is nothing his crew can do to help him there. Um, in his defense, you know, you say sometimes a referee loses sight of the puck. Yeah. He blows the whistle. This wasn't a true case of him losing sight of the puck. He thought he knew where it was and he thought it was in the goalie's chest. The goalie brought both gloves up, yep. made it look like he was... I think the goalie thought he had it. I think so, and, too. And if, and if you watch the slow motion replay, if you watch yeah. every player on the ice, there's not one player looking skyward. All the players, are the heads are down thinking the goalie has the puck. Yeah. So it's just unfortunate. But what's really unfortunate is when that puck bounced, that it didn't just bounce in the net on its own because they could have allowed that goal. Oh. That would have been what they... It's called a culmination of a continuous play. So if the puck goes in the net unaffected by the whistle, okay. it doesn't matter. you can count the goal. The problem here is it hit the flyer player in the glove, and then yeah. I think it bounced off the Washington uh, defenseman's stick. So you can't have any human uh, physical contact with the puck. If that had just landed and bounced across the goal line, that would have probably been a 60-second review, and he would have had a good goal. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I know Kelly in his head is just going, God, like – a, I wish I could suck the wind out of that whistle, but but B, why did anybody have to touch it? Why couldn't yeah. it just take yeah. one of those football bounces where it kind of hits yeah. and rolls across the goal line, and or, we would have had a good goal? Or get some puck luck like teams get. You know what I mean? So that was bad puck luck for the referee. Yeah, I mean, so I, like I said, just, you feel for Kelly, and then and, and, and again, people think sometimes it's like, oh God, they're cheering because they want Washington to make the playoffs, and you know, like that just bothers me. It does, and I'm sure it bothers you yeah. or. 
any efficient, but you guys can shrug it off where I can't shrug it off, but well, maybe you're better off at shrugging it off. You know what? Uh, look at the wrinkles on his face. You can see my <laughs> I was never good at shrugging yeah. things off. I had sleepless nights. Uh, people think that when referees make a mistake, yeah. they just, there's no accountability. Uh, there's a ton of accountability. I mean, there's 36 referees and yeah. only 20 get playoffs. So almost half the staff goes home. And it's built on your, your, it's predicated on your body of work during the season, your performance. So you have too many of those situations where you're wrong. You, you're, you're going home April 15th, and it's not a good feeling. I'm going to leave you to food, but I want to get back to that after how, how you yeah, get evaluated on. I want to talk about that. Yeah, too, perfect. It is also what I was just going to leave. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, good. Good. I didn't want to take <laughs> sorry, it away I from just, you. So No, I, that's just what I wanted to get into because we talk about um, you know, referee accountability and how it's kind of behind closed doors. And yeah. you're saying, you know, half of almost half of them go home at, at, at the end of the regular season. Yeah. And um, I just think that transparency, I think, is a frustration, especially in a social media age sure. where we see everything all the time in high definition and slow motion and everything. Yeah. Right. After games, coaches have to talk. Players have to talk. If I do something stupid, I have to talk. And the only people that don't are officials. And so I just, I, I would like to know more. Um, just what, what is that process of accountability that happens sure. after games? You know, when a call is right, when a call is wrong, just can you just walk us through what sure. actually happens after a sure. game? Yeah. And, and I get a lot of people saying to me, they want referees to give press conferences after the game. I we, don't see we are that. also on that. I, I, I don't see that as being a viable uh, uh, thing because you look at a team's press conference. Let's let's say you get a, a, a defenseman overtime. He puts the puck out in his own slot and they bang it top shelf. I'm pretty much guaranteeing that player is not going to be in that press conference. He's going to be taking therapy from his trainer. From something <laughs> he's unavailable. <laughs> he's unavailable. They're not putting him on the spot. And even if they did put him on the spot, you've got home team PR guys that are kind of there to make sure the media doesn't. Yeah. You know, it, it's still sure. their team, so they're upset about the play, but it's their player. They're not really that upset. But the referees have no protection. They'd be just sitting ducks out there from media that are angry that they perceive their team just got the raw end of the deal. And, and those things could become contentious, and we don't, we don't want that to happen. I think a good compromise would be have a pool reporter go into the referee's yeah, locker room. This, is, this yeah. has always been my solution. Uh, Mainly in playoff games, or mainly if it's something really egregious. Not why didn't you call that trip, or why did you know whatever. If it's yeah. something really where there's actually rules involved, an explanation of the rule and what transpired, you send a pool reporter in. And he could ask the question. Referees be much more comfortable, not as confrontational. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, and they want they want referees to be fined for mistakes. I'm like, well, you don't find a defenseman for yeah, I'd, I'd for making a mistake. You don't find a goaltender for letting in a bad goal. You know, what referees get fined is the 16 of them to go home. Yeah. They don't get playoffs. Playoffs are big, big bonus money for officials. So they don't get that. And I, sort of, I haven't even answered your question yet. But, <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, so referees, they go to training camp in the fall. It's a tough training camp. Physical, uh, you do all your physical, uh, you know, push-ups, sit-ups, body fat. I mean, the whole thing. Uh, ride the bike, you, do, you run. They make sure you're in good shape. But then the rest of training camp is watching video. Watching video, watching what the league standard is. Here's the league standard. Here's what we want you to call. You, you'll see 40 videos on slashing, 40 videos on boarding. What is a penalty? What isn't a penalty? And then at the end of camp, Mr. Batman comes in. He stands up front with Colin Campbell, and he tells the referees. He goes, gentlemen, we've just spent a lot of money. I'm bringing you guys here, showing you what we want. And you guys should know what a penalty is. If it's a penalty, we want you to call it. And if it's in October or if it's in June, if it's a penalty, we want you to call it. And I and hockey ops will support you. So this whole thing about, oh, the league doesn't want referees calling penalties, and it's not true. They want you calling the standard, and they tell you they will support you. In my, you know, in my history, that's been the case. You do get supported. You go out on the road, first games, there's supervisors that travel to these games. Uh, there's about seven, eight of them. And during the season, you'll have someone in the building live, probably 40% of your games, who will come down after the game and debrief the entire game. They'll tell you what you did right, tell you what you did wrong, tell you how to improve if you're a, you know, a younger referee and what needs to be done. And then weekly, you get calls at a week, videos, show you this is the right call, this is the wrong call. You get rule tests once a week, which don't oh. really, they don't, I mean, those aren't 
they're, they're more for fun. They're just to get guys into the rule book, reading the rule book, making yeah. sure they're staying on top. It's like a friendly competition. <laughs> Sounds you know? very fun. No, I mean, the winner, the winner of that gets some kind of bonus at training camp. Uh, I'm not even sure what it is. Used to be, used yeah. to uh, room, tutor room, you get your own room type of thing if you won the rules quiz over the season. It's just to get guys, nice. make sure they're checking the rules and all that. Um, every game guys work, they come back to their room or the next morning on the, on the plane, whatever, they open up their laptop and their entire game has been uh, logged and clipped. And every call they made and every call that the hockey operations in Toronto, there's a guy dedicated to every single game being played. If there's 10 games going on at once, there's 10 different individuals in Toronto at the Situation Room who are grading that game. Missed calls, good calls, calls that should have been made, uh, any kind of controversy. And these guys self-evaluate. They, they watch those tapes and they can clip right to the things. They don't have to watch the whole entire 60 minutes. They can go call by call by call and see for linesmen, it would be face-offs, a bad face-off where they got burnt or whatever. This is what you need to work on. And then in mid-season, you get a performance review. All your strengths, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. And then come April 19th, you get a letter and you're either in the playoffs or you're out. So there's a lot of accountability. It, you're talking about all these things that get reviewed from ref to ref. So I'm curious, a referee's opinion on the evolution of reviews in the NHL as a whole, the, the goalie interferences, the offsides, the expansion of major penalties more recently. Are refs in on that? Are, are refs a fan of that? Or is, or is it too much? Is it not enough? As I said, these wrinkles and gray hair. <laughs> Man, I, what I would have given, I would have killed for the review that we have now. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I vividly, unlike a player that remembers his, you know, the hat trick you might have scored or the game-winning goal yeah. or the playoff clinching goal, as a referee, you tend to focus on the calls you missed, the career-defining calls you missed. <laughs> and I can think back to playoff games where, you know, I, I, I'd call a double minor on a team for high sticking. Turns out it was a follow-through or, or it was his own player. And if we'd have had the video back then, yeah. you know, I would have slept a lot better that night. And I probably would have gone on to the next round. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I always say that, like, <laughs> it, it's, it's the game's changed so much, you know. And I used to say when I was working with the Avs or whoever I was working with, there's three ways to look at a game. There's, there's from the press box, which, and you've seen me play. I'm not a Hall of Famer on the ice, but I'm a Hall of Famer on the press box. I think we all are. I think we all are. Yeah. I, you agree with me. And you're a Hall of Fame referee. Everybody, I mean, you're the best referee ever from up top. And you uh, get better when you retire, too. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's revisionist exactly. history. <laughs> and then there's, there's, there's the bench view, right? You know yeah. what I mean? And then there's the, I'm talking about, forget about refs, you know? I'm talking about video, you know what I mean? Like the TV, you got three different aspects. After a game, you could be talking about the game and you're like, oh, wow, this, no, I felt that this was the, the you know, we did this, we did that. And then the bench will be like, no, 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 it was all, we were awful with this. You know, it's kind of weird, you know? So what I'm trying to say is, I always said to myself, go down to ice level, which I did. Once a month, I would go down, watch the third period by the Zamboni and something. And then you don't realize how freaking good guys are how fast it is and then i always put myself in that position to pass being a player right what if i'm a referee like oh i mean it's so freaking tough at eye level like at ice level to see everything and get nitpicked by all the tv you know angles that we get and all the replay yep. so i i just want you like how do you feel like towards the end of your career and nowadays how fast this game is and how hard it is for for referees and how good they are, because you know that. Like I, I've yelled at referees my whole life yeah, until you learn to respect them, and you know. And, and I, and again, not because you're here, but I've always said like I tell these guys all the time, Jax is the best. And you don't realize it because when you're a player, you, you never tend to say like referees are awesome. You know, you're always like, oh, freaking, yeah. I hate Fraser, I hate Jax, or whatever. Well, you it's a I mean? confrontational it's dynamic. More, exactly, yeah. it's just <laughs> yeah. the way it is, but. You learn the respect of what you guys do. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Like Jay Shares was here this summer and you needed someone to go help him out. I was the first guy to go and help out. And yep. You know what I mean? Because I respect those guys. But for me, I think the respect is like the speed of this game is absolutely insane now. And how do you feel it is for those referees nowadays, those officials yep. nowadays compared to, let's say, 20 years ago or 15 years ago? How much it has evolved in their job description, so to speak, you know? Well, the game just exponentially faster since I left the ice. Yeah. I mean, I left in 2018, and I look out there now, and obviously I get two new hips <laughs> and bad knees, <laughs> but I mean, all things being equal, I'm not sure when I left in 2018 if I could actually 
work in today's game in 2024. It's just, it right. seems That's to be that much point. faster. Yeah. And um, the director of officiating, Stephen Walkham, who was a yep. longtime uh, um, official and yep. longtime director of officiating, he encourages his on-site supervisors. He says, you know what? Don't get in the habit of always being in the press box <laughs> because it looks get very easy there. from there up there. Go. Yeah. He goes, if it's a game where, you know, uh, it might be a blowout or something and fans are leaving, go down halfway through the third period and sit one of the empty seats. That's right. And watch the game from ice level and see what these guys are doing. Because some of these supervisors have been off the ice for 10, 15 years. And you don't really get a feel for how much the game just keeps ramping up year after year after year. Yeah. And yeah, as a fan, I've talked to fans who sit at ice level against the glass. And invariably, nine times out of ten when the whistle goes, they're like, what happened? What happened? Because... <laughs> You just, there's no space on the ice. When you look from the press box, it's a beautiful big sheet of ice, lots of room for everybody. Oh, yeah. There's no room out there. <laughs> there is no room on that ice because it's not played yeah, in 200 foot. It's played in 60 foot, you know, <laughs> areas. Yeah. Uh, you know, either end zone or neutral zone. It's not, it's not spread out over 200 feet. There's no room out there and it's fast. And you're trying to get it away the puck. It's, 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 it's tough. Is that speed, is the inevitable outcome of this more electronic assistance, maybe more for, for linesmen than referees, for things like offsides, player tracking, puck tracking, are we headed there eventually in the NHL, or are they holding out on that? You know what? I think, much like baseball, you, I yeah. mean, you could probably referee a game by video. Sure. If you had enough cameras. That I, I mean, you can never... What well, might look like a hook at, at in the press box level? Might not be. When at I'm all, standing yeah. as close to you and I realize that you're grabbing the guy's stick yeah. and falling down, that's not seen by video. Sure. So, so I really think you need the referee on the ice to get the feel of the game. And, and refereeing is all about feel of the game. I mean, not every penalty is a penalty. Hockey's a gray area, it's not black and white. Yep. But I think the biggest thing is that how long would the game take if we refereed by video? <laughs> like if you took the referees away and you're sitting up there and go, wow, that's a hook, but you can't blow the buzzer right away because you got to watch the replay two or three times to make sure it's a hook. You don't want to be stopping away if you're now wrong. It's too late. So yeah. then you blow the whistle 20 seconds later and then you reset the clock. For the yeah. I mean, the games would take yeah. six hours. Yeah. You just, it's, I don't think it's feasible. Uh, I, I had a couple more questions and, and then we'll let you get out of here. Uh, number one, and this is a pet peeve of mine specifically as a referee, if someone's on a partial breakaway, walk me through <laughs> what you're looking for to call a penalty shot. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. Rudo's like <laughs> big Rudo, on Rudo hates I, this. We can't have he a show with this. the ref on and me not ask. Yeah. Well, let me, let, me, let me first say the evolution of the penalty shot. Sure. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. And, and I think the shootout has taken a bit of glitter away from the penalty shot. I, I mean, would agree with that. The, for the sure. penalty shot used to be something you might see once a year. Yeah. And when you did, it was a special. Yeah. It was, hey, man, I saw a penalty, oh, yeah. I saw oh, a penalty yeah. shot tonight, right? Um, I don't think that it quite has that mm. glitter anymore because, you, you know, you see a True. shooter after the game. But True. when I started in 19, so I started with the NHL in 1986 in the minors. First NHL game was 1990. And up until about 2010, I might have had, I count on one hand, the number of penalty shots I called. And then from 2010 to 2018 when I retired, I probably call four or five a year. And we never used to call enough penalty shots. Oh, yeah. Never used to call enough because for whatever reason, the which way hockey was, it took an axe murder to, to, call, <laughs> to call a penalty shot. <laughs> and then <laughs> there was no real rule change. It's just as a group of officials and with our bosses and Stephen Walkham and all that, we sort of discussed at a training camp and said, guys, we don't need to make a rule change. We just need to change how we interpret the rule. And... Guys are getting scoring chances taken away that, that shouldn't be, and they're not being penalized. They should be restored. So, so for me, if I'm looking as a referee, if the guy has a breakaway and he's fouled from behind and he doesn't get a shot off as good as he could have gotten off without being fouled, I'm calling a penalty shot. So even if it's on net, you would call it? If it's less than a quality of opportunity. If I, if I deem the shot to be less of a quality shot than he could have got, if he wasn't fouled, yes. Okay. I believe it's still worth a penalty shot. All right. I am, I am here for this take. I, I like Good. this take. Uh, the other one I had, Eric has told us uh, quite a few stories back from his Halifax days. Uh, I'm curious if you have any fun stories being on the road as a referee or in Halifax or, or anything like that. I was telling these guys, I said it was so funny in the American League back then because... 
Well, you're just a you were already in the league, kind of. You know what I mean, like in the NHL. But yeah. I remember growing up as a player um, with whatever, like Donnie Van Massa, well, all the guys that were yeah. making cutting their teeth in that, the American that's League. That's kind of and, my era. Right, you just missed it. You just, I, I, I might just, have been a year or two ahead of that. I but, missed uh, you in the American League because yeah. I remember. Um, but everybody would end up at the same bar in, in Halifax, right? And three it was nights just, in a row. Yeah, two, yeah, yeah, three nights in a row. You play three games, but Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, and you'd be in the same bar. And you got to know guys. You and got it to was know so, guys. Like you were saying earlier, like you get to know guys as human beings, and that's why you know I tell these guys all the time. It's funny because it's a profession, it's a job. As a player, yeah, you you have your job to do, and then referees have their jobs to do. And but it's funny because you end up in in a public place, and everyone's in it together as a family. It's kind of nice. I mean, the hockey family is nice, and yeah, I always tell these guys that it's. It was fun to interact with those guys. And then now you make it to the NHL. And then those guys make it to the NHL. And you always like kind of root for them, so to speak, right? You know what I mean? For so sure. I, I just, that's what he was talking about. Because I always say the, the American League is so fun for that because you, well, you build relationships with people. You, you, you know, know what? And I'm not sure at what point in your NHL career you started chartering. Yeah. But, oh, you're right. Yes. But when I was in the NHL, when I began in the NHL, all the NHL teams flew commercial. Yeah. Uh, maybe not in playoffs, but in regular season. And there was no worse feeling. I mean, I remember one night where I, I didn't have my best game in Tampa. Yeah. And uh, Phil Esposito had to be restrained by a cop from coming at me in the hallway. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? He probably uh, wasn't wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't my best game. Yeah. But it paled in comparison to me sitting there reading my newspaper next morning and having the entire Tampa team walk on the plane, <laughs> including <laughs> Philas Bazir and everybody else. And I just, newspaper in front of my face, <laughs> hoping they didn't recognize me. I mean, it's a terrible feeling. But, but um, for Love example, it. my first year in the league, I mean, I'd be out in Vancouver. And you'd go to a, a you go grab a bite to eat and end up in the bar for a drink. And you'd see the, like the whole Buffalo Sabres would be yeah. in the bar. Yeah. And... They just lost, and maybe you threw one of the guys out of the game, and here he comes at you, go, oh, now you're going to get it again. And he's got a beer in his hand. He goes, hey, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't really know you. Like, what's your background? And you talk for half an hour. Yeah. You'd buy him a beer back, and next time you see him on the ice, That's right. he still might yell at you, <laughs> and I still might call a penalty on him, but yeah. there's sort of a mutual. I find t people tend to yell at the stripes until they know that who, who the guy is wearing the stripes, and sure. then it becomes a lot more personable. I, 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 that leads me to quickly, like, I felt, I feel, again, that's from the outside because I'm not on the bench, you know? I feel the guys that, am I right to say that the rapport was a little better back then than it is now? Or is it different? You know what I mean? Like, I just feel that guys had a better rapport with the players, between the players and the referees than it is now. Well, I think there were fewer teams. Yeah. And there were fewer referees. So when I, when I came in in, in uh, 1990, yeah. it was one referee, and our staff consisted of, I think, 12 referees. Yeah. 12 referees, 21 teams. So you saw the teams way more often. You saw yeah, them all. Sure. Now you've got 32 teams, yeah. and you've got 36 referees. You don't see the referees as much. And the referees hung around longer, and the players hung around longer. Yeah. When I started in the league, there was a whole bunch of 35, 36, 37-year-olds on every team. And so they'd been in the league 16 years. They knew you. Now it's a, it's a league of 20-year-olds who, you know, they're only there for maybe they're, unless you're a star. Yeah. You're not there as many years. A lot more referees. You don't get to know them. Yeah. You just don't get to know them because – but I still think there is – you get guys like Kelly Sutherland. Yeah. Everybody knows who he is. Dan O'Rourke. Um, you know, Eric Furlat. There, there, there's a lot of guys out there. The players know who they are, and they have good rapport with them. Yeah. All good. Seems to me like if the fans know your name as a ref, it might not be a good thing, though. <laughs> when as first, opposed to the players. When I first came in, we had names on the back I of know. our sweaters. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's something when you were in junior hockey, you couldn't wait. I shouldn't say you couldn't wait. You never knew if you were going to make the NHL. Sure. But I'd love to be in the NHL and have my name on the back of my sweater. And uh, when they took the names off, I can't say I wasn't disappointed. But I <laughs> after, got it. <laughs> but after about a year... They knew who number eight was. <laughs> They're yelling my name. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, they hated me just as much. So it wasn't uh, the recognition factor was still there. We do have three very quick questions sure. from our Toyota chat powered by the Toyota 4Runner here. The first one from Josh who says, Hi, Dave. Do you think they should change the puck over the glass penalty? A lot of people, myself included, would like to see it be treated as an icing. Well, you could treat it as an icing. Uh, players wouldn't be able to change. Yep. Uh, the thing is, 
it would be abused. Because <laughs> it used to be for, I don't know how old Josh is, but it used to be a judgment call. Puck over the glass was a judgment. I remember. And I don't think in my entire career until it became an automatic penalty, I ever called it once. <laughs> yeah. Okay? And I was talking to the uh, off-ice, the uh, official scorer in Toronto one night, when they were going to think of bringing this rule in, and it was his job to monitor how many pucks were out of play. Not shots over the net, but the sure. defenseman breaking out. And it was something like between 19 and 26 times a game. And they couldn't all have been accidents, <laughs> right? So I think, sure, you treat it like that, but expect 20 more stoppages per game. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know we have to get on with this, and I don't want to argue about it, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'd throw the puck in the stands if I'm out of breath. <laughs> oh, absolutely. In our experience, didn't happen that often from the games we've watched. But moving on. Which is fine. Brechton asks, we've seen it at the AHL level. Is it looking like we'll see women referees working in the NHL soon? It's a great question. Uh, I believe the American League has eight referees, and they started with a few more linesmen, and then I think just the physicality of the, of the game as a linesman, I think a few of them might have dropped off. Uh, there's, still, there's still a handful uh, who do a good job, and uh, look, there's no reason a woman can't referee at the NHL. It's not a physical job. I mean, obviously skating and, and it is physical, but um, as far as manhandling players, it's all about being able to skate at the NHL level and understand the game and get the respect. Uh, linesman, you'd have to be a strong, awfully strong woman, but I mean, I'm sure it's coming. It's coming every other sport. And I've watched a lot of female officials and they do a great job. I mean, they know the game and just watch the PWHL and they're, they're, they're rocking it. Can I, before we get to those other questions, can, just to follow up. You have like five more minutes. We can slow it down a I little bit. I got half an hour. All right, oh. cool. <laughs> the, the pipeline of officials, how has it changed over time? And is there, given the scrutiny that officials are under now, is, is it harder to find people that actually want to sign up for that job? Well, I don't know if it's harder, but the, the pipeline has definitely changed. When I came into the league, it was, it consisted pretty much solely of guys that I wouldn't say were failed hockey players, but guys that never went past junior hockey. Sure. You never had ex-pro players. Uh, Paul Stewart was an exception. Yep. Uh, but you never had pro players uh, refereeing. And that was okay because and this, is, this is my theory. I played pretty good hockey growing up. I played double-A hockey. Um, I was never going to make it as a player. But I played travel hockey. But playing the best hockey I could in my town – still only got me on the ice three, four nights a week. So I had three nights a week where I wanted something to do. So I started refereeing at the same time I was playing. I was an elite athlete at, at, at 14. Elite, I mean, compared to house league <laughs> hockey players. Um, but now your elite hockey players are playing seven times yeah. a week. They're yeah. on the ice seven days a week, plus they're off, land, uh, off ice conditioning. They don't have time to referee. So what you're getting now at the minor hockey level is you're getting a lot of referees that love the game but might not have the physical uh, skating ability and the knowledge of the game, of having played. A, because, let's face it, you need to know the game. You have had to play a, at least at some kind of high level of competitiveness to know what it feels like to get whacked across the wrist or planted into the end yeah. boards. You need to know how it feels. You, you, you need to understand the game of hockey. So there's not as many good hockey players growing up that are refereeing as when I first came into the league. And Stephen Walkham decided, oh, going back about 10 years now, to hold a combine in Buffalo and send out letters to all junior teams, American League teams, uh, Canadian university teams, saying, if you have players that are probably going to hang it up at the end of their career, why don't you ask them to give officiating a chance? Come to our combine. Pay your own way to the combine, and we'll supply everything else. Give you referee equipment, meals. Uh, we'll put you in a hotel. And it's a weekend of, it's actually, they bring their hockey equipment. They play high level four on four round robin tournament, eight games. And when you're not playing, you put a referee's jersey on a referee. And some guys come out of that weekend combine and go, I love this. And the league will place them. They'll place them maybe in the, in the NAL or in the USHL, East yeah. Coast League, if they're really good. Um, and other guys go, I thought I was gonna like it and not a chance. I mean, I was getting yelled at by guys I know, and it's not even contact hockey, I can't imagine, and then it's just not for them. But it's a really great pipeline that they're getting guys that A, know the game, and B, are great skaters and good athletes. Uh, question from Luke here, kind of along the same lines. 
How should a young ref grow their skills as a ref to get to the pro level? Work as many games as you can. Doesn't matter the level because there's always something going to happen. Yeah. It, you know, something you have never seen happen, it's going to happen. It's going to happen in a squirt game. It's going to happen in a U14 game. Do as many games as you can and pick the brains of as many older mentors as you can. And just, you just, be, just be a sponge. Absorb as much information as you can. And then one final question here from Drew. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on when the written rule may sometimes circumvent the spirit of the rule, such as a called back goal for being a millimeter offside. Well, we can go. Eric's going to remember. You guys probably might. We had the toe in the crease yeah. rule. I, oh, I back know this in story. Well, 19, yeah. 1999. And that, so that was a lot of unintended consequences. There was, how are we going to fix the crease? And it went from, okay, well, if there's a toe in the crease, it's no goal. Even if you're not affecting the, that'll just keep players out of the crease. But it didn't, because guys accidentally skate in the crease. So they said, okay, well, let's make it a coach's challenge because there's too many goals being disallowed. So let's set the coach challenge. So then the coaches would challenge every time again, goals disallowed. And then we got to the playoffs and they changed it again and said, well, it's got to come from the ice, but you guys have to initiate it. And then we go to review and watch the video. And then, I mean, and then we have Brett Hall scoring, in my opinion, and I'll, I will defend that goal. That was a good goal. It just wasn't explained properly. <laughs> but regardless, the toe in the crease rule disappeared after that yep. season. And um, I think sometimes we try and... Were you playing when Duchesne was offside here in Colorado? No, I was working. You were working? Yeah. So Duchesne scored a goal where he was, he was nine... Eight, he was eight feet offside. He was nine <laughs> feet offside. Yeah. And <laughs> how often do you guys see that happen? Maybe once a year or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But we decided we're going to fix it. We're going to bring a rule in, which I think is a great idea. But now, where did we draw the line? Yeah. I, I don't think we brought it in to fix an egregious uh, circumvention of the rule. And, and now, law of unattended consequences, we're being held to tolerances that the game was never designed to be held to. Yep. Like Landis in Game 7 against San Jose. Should have got off the ice. I mean, this guy's getting on the bench. Should have got off the ice. Oh. I don't disagree, but it was that was one thing that, without that rule, true, that yep. game's different. Yep. yep. Or you, we got Kale that oh he's got full control on. Does he have like, that like, yeah. like, yeah. 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 Oh, he knows yeah. what he's doing. Like, there's no way. I, mean, I don't think I, he knew what he was doing. I don't think. I was, think it's just like <gasps> you panic but, and then they just. But he was very fortunate that he stick didn't touch the puck. Yeah, exactly. I've still got Edmonton fans that they call me a liar. <laughs> on, on, on Twitter, they think I'm just a shill Us for. Too. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but they think I'm either a shill for the league or a shill for um, yeah. uh, the Colorado Avalanche, trying to defend Us that too. the play was offside. <laughs> yeah. and, and you know what? Going back, going back to the days before we had video review for offside, that would have been a whistle. The linesman would have said. That yeah. looks offside. Yeah. But because he knows, and I'm not saying they never... I was going to ask you that. Yeah. 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 They yeah. never let the close yeah. ones go because they're not sure. Because you don't want to be that linesman that at the end of the season when the stats come out, huh. they're just internal stats. But when the boss goes, wow, Eric had 26 goals called back <laughs> on offside. That's a lot of goals. The next closest guy was five. <laughs> that you, know? you don't want to. You don't want to be that one. <laughs> You don't want to be that linesman. Yeah. Yeah. So you react as if there's no cameras. You, you, are, you are trying to get the call right in real Interesting. time. Interesting. However, when it's a play like that, when a guy coming off and in, you can give it that extra second because you can blow your whistle two seconds late if you want. You give that extra second, and in his opinion, he took that extra second and went, I don't think he touched it. I'm waving it off. And if you watch that video, he didn't wave it off immediately. He took that extra second and waved it off, and he got it right. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's incredible how good they really are at their job. No, it is. It is. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to give you a moment here to shout out whatever you want to shout out, what you're working on, anything in specific where people can find you. Go for it. Well, you can find me on any game produced by ESPN. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to be busy in the playoffs. Uh, we got the finals this year on ABC. And uh, I just try and I just try and explain rules. Um, I don't critique the referees. I explain the rules, explain what happened, what they should have been looking at. And I think if that helps educate the fan base, it means you're going to grow your fan base. And that's yep. people enjoy watching sports. They understand. And yep. if I can help contribute to that and you find me on Twitter, um, ESPN ref NHL, you want to send me real questions, keep it respectful. And I'll, I will, 
love to have a healthy debate with you. So I'll, I'll add more to it. And then I always say, because I tell kids all the time, like, people tell me all the time, like, oh, I love hockey. I love hockey. And there's a way to stay in hockey. Uh, you know what I mean? Like Dave just said it. He wasn't the best player. But all of a sudden, he had a freaking... 100 year career in the in the NHL you know what I mean like in hockey and and I'll say it because he doesn't want to say it about his kids but he's got two kids and I mean well two boys two boys two boys one's linesman in the NHL so that's runs in the family which is awesome and then he's got one that works with KO Sports right and with Kurt Overhart as an agent so again you're in hockey you are part of the big family so i think it's awesome and i just wanted to say thank, well, thank you as you. well but i think it's great that you know you you're brought up in that environment and your kids kind of saw that the, your passion was there and then i'm sure they played well, hockey my, too and yeah, you they know did. they exactly. did my, and my daughter loves hockey and she's about to go to university i'm telling her you know you're undecided what you want to do get a sports degree get a sports management sports yeah. marketing something i mean between the three of us we can at least steer you to an internship somewhere <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah all right, Dave, thank you for coming on. We're going to let you go. I know you got bigger shows than ours to do today. Pleasure, so guys. Thanks we for having me. appreciate y'all. While appreciate you're getting the time. out thank of you. here, uh, we are brought to you by Toyota and your Front Range Toyota dealerships. Make sure you go ahead and get over to your local dealerships today. Uh, jump on it with Toyota. Of course, there are tons of different vehicles that you can get on with, uh, whether it be the Forerunner I've already mentioned, or if you're a truck person, they have the Tundra. Of course, tons of other vehicles, too, including 16 different hybrid vehicles that you can choose from. Uh, get with it with Toyota. Again, your local front range. Toyota dealerships are where you can get the official vehicle of the Colorado Avalanche and the official vehicle of DNVR. Go find them today at one of AutoNation Toyota, Arapahoe and Centennial, Corwin at Toyota in Boulder, Groove Toyota in Littleton, Mountain State Toyota in Denver, Stevenson Toyota East in Aurora, or Stevenson Toyota West in Lakewood. And once you're driving around in your new Toyota, make sure you're getting with the gang at Underdog Fantasy. Fun fact, if you had picked uh, Connor McDavid, 100 assists higher, probably could have made a lot of money on Underdog Fantasy. Some pretty crazy stats for him this year. He's not the only one either, to yeah. be honest. Uh, I, uh, I've done okay on Underdog picking uh, Nikita Kucherov to do things. Points higher, Kucherov seems like a, a pretty good bet most of the time, yeah, especially empty net points. Maybe. <laughs> well, it's been it's been uh, I've been I've been able to get uh, the stats on points and assists. Assists are those are that's the juice on Kucherov. Those two sure. those two have yeah. done well for me, so I've enjoyed that. <laughs> Look, maybe you can have a little bit of fun with it going in on the fantasy. You can do it with underdog Nathan McKinnon, higher two higher a point and a half, I guess tomorrow to get to 140. Please. <laughs> Is that more of a, a wishful thinking than actually the fantasy pick you would uh, you would like to make? Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. It is manifesting. <laughs> Playing their pick'em game is really that easy, though. You can just select higher or lower on a player's stats, like points, rebounds, assists, uh, whatever you're looking for. You can get it with Underdog Fantasy. Uh, I've dabbled with it a little bit. My personal favorite bet is not hockey, though. It's picking, uh, it's picking the lower half a run given up in the first inning in baseball. All you have to do... Pick honestly, it. I dig it. It's, it's, honestly, it hits often enough it's, that it's, it's like... It's sneaky good. All you have to do, pick... Between two and five picks over on Underdog to get your money in. Uh, sign up today with promo code DNVR and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Uh, you also get their instant pick em special in your lobby. Again, Underdog Fantasy Code DNVR. Must be 18 and over and present in a state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play, call 1 800 522 4700 or visit www.ncpgambling.com. Org. Okay, second period of the DMVR Avalanche <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Hey, I didn't know what she was doing. Oh, she. Oh, I see. Because yeah, yeah. Dude, you guys like switched out a whole chair while I was doing those reads. That's impressive, to be honest. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I'm curious, your guys' thoughts. NHL refing. Hearing it from the referee side. Is he out of the building? <laughs> it's a dog shit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. 
I mean, I think there are nights when it's dog shit. Of course. I but, mean, he even just admitted. Yeah, right, you know, exactly. Like, they Some are, nights are, you have bad nights. Officials are human. Yep. They yeah. are prone to error. They do have bad nights, just like all of us do. Yep. So, you know. That's life. No, they It's, it's kind of like a goaltender, right? It, there's nowhere to hide if you're an official on a bad night. You, you just don't. You aren't having a good. Uh, you aren't having a good. You don't have a good showing. Yep. You just kind of have to eat it. <laughs> it's on you. There's nothing to do. You, you're not a forward that you can just play fewer minutes. <laughs> yep. You don't get benched when you're a ref. Right. <laughs> well, no, only in the playoffs, I yeah. guess. Well, I mean, not I'm, mid-game. How about that? Yes. Yeah. No, but I've learned to, to gain a lot of respect. And, and they're all great guys. I mean, obviously, Jax lives here in town. Uh, Watson lives here in town, too. Uh, so there used to be a few more. I don't know if there's more of the newer guys that live here in town. But, you know, they, Jack's from Montreal. Yep. So he... He was put in L.A. all those years, and, you know, that's where you're based out of. And obviously ended up moving to Denver And um, Good when, call. when the avalanche came. And, you know, so obviously this guy's based out of here. But it's funny because what, what kind of stuck to me there, what he said was players are remembered, like, you know, McKinnon's remembered for his 140-point season or, or that goal he scored or, you know what I mean, like, or, or the cons. And referees are remembered for... For the calls they blew. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, like, it's crazy. You got to be able to um, have that personality that can handle that. You know yeah. what I mean? But he even said it. Like, he's had a lot of sleepless nights. And I know he made jokes about it, but I get it. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. It's tough. It, like, it's... The reality of the job is the best game a ref can have is a game where nobody thinks about him at all. That's right. They don't even know who ref. You know, like, oh, who was it? You know, so... But, hey, awesome guy, and, you know, I'm glad he came. That was fun. So, uh, It was an interesting conversation, too. Yeah. Um, as combative as we are towards officials, like, during games, and <laughs> yeah. it's the heat of the moment. It's yeah. the same thing with players. Like, we're yelling yeah. at the TV and, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did really appreciate his uh, just give us a pool reporter yeah. to yeah. be less yeah. combative. Totally. It's always been how I've wanted yeah. to do it. I think we're that that is... To- crucify him out yeah, there right like we're not yeah. trying to we're not trying to put in montreal media into a room with one guy and and be like i demand an explanation in two languages like a pool reporter <laughs> two languages a pool like, reporter just to get their clarification. side of how they saw it just yeah, like, just clarification sure. just explain how you called the game why you called the game um i i i will always believe that that public accountability is a port Im- important yep um I don't necessarily think that. Oh well, they don't work the playoff games. All right. Well, neither do half the half the teams yeah. in the league. Yeah, yeah. You know, like the I, bad teams also don't make the playoffs. Exactly. Just like the bad reps. It's just yeah. it's it's. Yeah. I just but all those teams still talk eighty two sure. games a year. Yep. Yeah. And so I do think that there is some level of public accountability that I I believe is important. And that, it's not going to make you feel any better. I well, mean, you're not. It's not going to fix I, anything. But I think it's an important part of the process that doesn't currently exist. I, I think he made a good point, too, when he talked about, hey, if a defenseman loses you the game, occasionally that guy will go out in front of the media and talk, but pretty often they won't. Fair enough. Then go get have a, the supervisor do the interview. And, and yeah, if you have an in-building supervisor, yeah. great. Yeah. Just the same way the head coach has to do a presser every game. Yeah, and then you get the human nature, like he said, Kelly Sutherland yesterday. You know, like you're like, oh shit. You know, I really thought I had the. Yeah, I didn't. You don't know. And then the bad puck luck, it hits a couple places. Then you're like, that's one I don't need a post game presser explanation for. You obviously didn't see it. Yeah, it fell into the net. We get it. To error is human, right? Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The error is human. That's why. And there, like he said, he felt so bad for him. You know what I mean? Because you know the guy felt bad. Yeah. It's like shoot, like. But no one's looking up, like you said. It's, you know, it's looking, very easy for us to build yeah. conspiracy theories. He was talking about Oilers yeah, yeah, fans. Yeah. Um, and be like, well, they, they want their precious avalanche to yeah, whatever. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, guys, they're just trying to get a call right. I know. And sometimes it sometimes it goes that way and sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't yeah. And it's it's an element of the game. Um, yeah, anyway. I, it was awesome. I, yeah, I thought it was an interesting discussion. And officiating is one of those things that does... It is the third team on the ice. It yep. does play a role in outcomes of games. Always you just has. want those outcomes to be justifiable. Yep. Yep. You want to understand how that's happening. Yep. And there have been some times where it is frustrating. I mean, the Landy offside is a thing that's going to stick in my craw for a long time. Oh, the rest of my life. Yeah. I agree with him. 
He needs to get off yeah, the ice. Yeah, exactly. The player could have done more there. No but yes. you, you also have a situation where a guy is getting off the yeah. ice. He's at the bench. You know, like, and, and that's, still, like, arguably might have been touching the blue line. Right. Like. We're not even <laughs> sure. And when he was talking about unintended consequences of, you know, the, the uh, skate in the crease rule. Yep. And whenever you're talking about changing rules, everybody always uses the phrase. I hate it, but it's, yeah. it always comes up. It's a slippery slope. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny that the Matt Duchesne thing eventually leads to the Gabe Landeskog yep. thing, which eventually leads to the <laughs> Kale McCarr against the Oilers <laughs> thing. And you're just kind of like, huh, this is a lot. It's a lot for one franchise. It's come a long way. I remember reading like, oh, look at the hockey says hockey. I can't. What? You have no idea. Yeah, in that, in that you're more like, oh, second. Shit. You're more like, am I, oh, shit, do I touch it or not? And like, you have no idea. There's no way. <laughs> It happens so quick, you know what I mean? Like, you yeah. have no idea. But whatever. It's, hey, that was fun. I, I mean, I think it's a fascinating conversation for the decades to come, for not just the NHL, but all leagues, <clears throat> and how they manage the development of technology, not just not just yeah. video technology, but we, we already see. They, they track players well enough to have a cartoon version of the game on, on a TV channel now. Yeah, it was like, pretty fun. Yeah, but the, I'm saying, like, how does that technology get integrated over the next 20 years? I couldn't tell you. Certainly, uh, when he was talking about video refereeing and all that, that's insane. Oh, you can't. You certainly can't only do that. Yeah. Like, but I think I think the puck tracking for uh, puck being fully across the line. Sure. Because there are times it's in a goalie's gear. You remember the it's, situation yeah. against the Wild a couple years where ago you had where to, like, you geometry the, that thing into the net. You knew the puck was in. <laughs> yeah. They called it a good goal. You never saw the puck. Yeah. But you're like, basic physics will just tell you that puck <laughs> is all the way across. I mean, give me a break here. Yeah. But you have you have some of those situations and with offside and with uh across the line, you can see where puck tracking would be a thing where you're like we're regularly talking about how fast Nathan McKinnon is skating in miles per hour. Yeah. We talk, we joke on all the time on watch alongs. Was that a 22 mile an hour <laughs> burst? Like <laughs> we should probably already be there. Get some more it, pertinent data to the game out of that track. We can't again. be, we can't be far off from adding that layer. Yeah. You into it. Yeah. I mean, you see how minor league baseball balls and strikes are challengeable now. And it will be in Major League Baseball in the next few years, thank God, because as somebody mentioned, Angel, Angel Hernandez, Hernandez exists, exists. <laughs> and uh, that is uh, a problem. Yep. It, it, when you have the opportunity to make it better, you should for the most part. Now, he did bring up another good point. Obviously, you know, only reffing by video is a very it's, extreme situation. It's an insane idea that makes no sense. But his point being, when you start adding these things in, the long game, and we already have this argument about challenging, is it making yeah. the game too long? Is it slowing things down too much? And there's a there's a line where the answer to that is yes. I just don't know what that line is. Yeah. And then as far as the icing goes, it's a, it's a re, or as far as the the puck over the glass, it's really easy. Yep. If you do it more than twice in a row, you get a penalty. Yeah. I, I if they want to make that a penalty for icing too, I'm down. This seems no. extreme, but he's right. It's funny, like because I played in that era that, you know, puck in the stands is not a penalty, and like he said, he's never called it once. Which I mean, in, in, I'm like, your judgment was bad then. <laughs> There were definitely some intentional times. No, but you know, that's what but, he's trying but, to say. You know it's like um, burp, but it's like, uh, this is, I, I, I mean, buddy, I've thrown pucks in the stack I, and I'm, tell you I that. I know like, that you people know, have done that intentionally. You can't breathe, and it's like, oh, Our chat know. will already know this because we've talked about it before, and I'm not saying we've watched every NHL game. I'm sure there were some games where they threw it out 20 times or whatever. But we watched the entire 96 playoff run for the Avs during the pandemic. We kept track of it. it. It just doesn't happen that often. Yeah. No, no, that's right. It happened It happened like seven times in four rounds. Yep. Where it was like a guy just flipped it over. Yeah. And, and to got get a breather, like a, breather style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like. I mean, they would warn you. Like, uh, honestly, even before a playoff round, like with the supervisor and say, hey. Let's not, you know, it's playoffs. Let's not take advantage of this, you know, <laughs> puck in the stands. And, you know, because we'll call it. Yeah. I mean, I remember Patty Wall one time coming out of his crease. And 
halfway through the zone like he froze the puck and he got penalized and i was like we're all in shock we're like what is that like yeah you and that's the same thing it's a call you never saw back then if yeah. you're out and you were freezing the puck and you know and you're out of i don't know if it still is like i should have asked jack gotta, gotta love patty wall weird weird rules yeah, yeah. Weird, but everyone measuring like, the stick skating yeah. the control line, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but i remember rice. patty getting oh a penalty and then we're all there on the bench and even as co- the coaches are like what the f- what the f- what is this like? <laughs> what is that? And uh, but those guys know the rules inside yeah, and out. Clearly. Those guys are paid to know the rules. And like he said, they get challenged on rules and weird things, and and they bring it back to training camp. And it's awesome. But you have to process it on the spot. You yeah. Know? And I remember, like that's what I'm saying. Like those rules that you never saw back then. That was like weird. You know what I mean? Because now they're automatic rules. You know what I mean? And then who knows? Did it really go above the glass? And then, you're, you know, you're huddling and the, you're just throwing a lot on their plate. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. That's just what I think. It's, it's a hard job. Man. Un- it is. Unbelievably it is job. difficult job. And I tough will still job. be yelling at them the next game. Yeah. yeah. So, but like I, wish, said, I wish we had another half hour because I've got all kinds of follow-up questions yeah. now. Yeah. They're oh, he's awesome. around up there. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome we'll just guy. Have to, we'll just have to bring him down here after the, uh, yeah. the playoffs. We'll bring when, there's, when there's time. Yeah, bring it back out. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, exactly. He said he would, so. Uh, on that note, look, I guess, I don't know. You don't have any referees for the draft. I can't make this segue work. But last in-person NHL draft happening in Vegas this year. Place to stay, Circa Resorts and Casinos. You got to get down there. In fact, you might even want to get down there, have a good time for the playoffs. You can take the playoff plunge with Circa in to stadium swim, the biggest outdoor screen. Great time of year. Yeah. To go to Vegas and jump into a pool right. and watch playoff hockey. On a 90 foot television. Oh, the best. I'm talking myself into this. <laughs> if the abs lose in round one, we got to go for might, round two. Yeah, I might go check that. Yeah. That, is we that can, the live stream from the cabana? Yeah, I was yeah. Gonna say, we can just, just do a pod from the pool. <laughs> I'm in. What a pina colada, you know? Tiff says no, so. We found a new fun hater. No, it's not us for once. I know, That's, right? It's, it just feels weird. <laughs> You're not a water person? This is, this is big. This is Tiffany energy. Okay. Anyway, they also have the world's <laughs> largest sports book. So it's a three-story stadium style with tons of VIP seating. Uh, oh, you can go geez. check that out. We, got to, we watched the uh, Rocky Mountain Showdown in it. Mm. Thing is huge. It's also very cool to hang out in. So that was a blast. Uh, Go check it out. Uh, Their casino is 7,000 square feet, uh, over 1,300 slots. Tons of amazing options with over 500 rooms with a variety of layouts to fit your needs. Experience Stadium Swim and watch your favorite teams at Circuit Resort and Casino. Book today with code DNVR20 to get 20% off at CircaSports.com. Once you've got all that booked, you're going to want to not worry about your house when you're going to Vegas. Not worried about any of the issues with it. That's why you call Lavello Construction. Uh, go through all of that. Make sure you get with them. Uh, Lavello Construction, awesome at what they do. Uh, here in Colorado, they take care of not just roofs, but basically the entire exterior of your home. Uh, that includes things like painting the outside of your house, gutters, siding, and all of that. They do it all around the front range. Uh, go give them a call if you haven't. Let don't let an inexperienced contractor give you the full court press. Call Lavello today. Uh, go get in with them at. Hmm. Oh God, I lost the number. Sorry, Lavello. Uh, go get in with them at three zero three five seven eight eight five five one, or you can just use that QR code on screen to make your life easier, and you'll get a quote in under a minute. Be quicker than a Landis Gog offside call. <laughs> <laughs> I regret bringing this up. Had to get it in, uh, and we are obviously gave most of our time to Dave Jackson to talk there. So we do have to hurry up things a little bit here. Uh, if you're getting tickets to a game, perhaps, whether it be in Vegas or not, use Game Time. Code DNVR to get $20 off your first purchase with Game Time. Uh, go get your tickets, whether it be at Ball Arena or to an away game. You can go to any event under the sun, basically. doesn't even have to be sports, theater, concerts, things like that. You can get them through game time as well. And they guarantee you the best price. If you find tickets cheaper somewhere else, they'll reimburse you 110% of the ticket price. So join the 15 million people using game time to get their tickets today with the link down in the description. And finally, make sure you're getting your Circle K snack on. 
with Circle K's Inner Circle. Delicious snacks for game day, and you can get great deals with Inner Circle, including your first five Phillips, 25 cents off a gallon, up to five free Polar Pops, and a bunch of other great snack deals every single day. As an Inner Circle Rewards member, use the QR code on screen or go to circlek.com slash inner circle rewards to get it all put together. Uh, super chats, and then we'll get our last thoughts, I guess. $10 from Drew, who says, picked the perfect day for a rain, rain day today. Uh, loved having you on the show, Mr. Jackson, and thanks for all the insight. Awesome, as always, DNVR. Appreciate you, Drew. $5 from RC Cola, who says, considering we have four Giev in net, what are the rules about having two tendies in the crease and icing four <laughs> skaters? That's that funny. would not be illegal, unfortunately. That's funny. You need the walrus like that commercial. Yeah. <laughs> we can't call them tendies. We call them fingers. It's true. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and then 27 Swede Bucks from Flats who says, should NHL refs simply call the rule book? In theory. Sure. But, you know, I, it's, it's funny because you can have two separate conversations here, right? You have refs. They are what they are. However you feel about them, fine. And then you also have the rule book, which I think there are at least a few rules in the rule book, which are generally agreed upon to be bad. It's also a dense. There's a lot rule in book. there. Yeah. Oh, buddy. It's like 180 pages or something. Yeah, I think. Nuts, I man. I it. It's not my earlier bag. point of, oh, we're going to give them more to do. Yeah. yeah no, they, there's so much to do. Like, and they know it all. They do. They do. They like that's their gig. That's their profession. They you test them, they'll go boom. They'll tell you where you and me might be like, ah, uh, well, uh, you know, they know it on this because they have to they react on the spot. Training camp quizzes about yeah. them. They got it. They got it on lock. Apparently, love it. It's it's interesting. I I, I think. We probably should have gotten into it more, but Eric, you kind of brought it up with the rapport between referees and and hockey players. Uh, it's important. It's a skill as a hockey team, as a hockey player to be able to communicate effectively and have those conversations with the refs. And it's those like, guys are humans that, you know, you can try and I'm not saying game the system. I'm not saying be a suck up to them or anything, but subconsciously human beings have biases. And if you're an asshole to a ref all the time. Oh, yeah. Hundred percent, and I like the point that he brought too. There's more referees now. There's more players. Like I never thought about it that way. You know what I mean? Like back then, we we kind of knew like the twelve guy, whatever it was. You know what I mean? Like you knew him. You know what I mean? Like you knew Billy McCreary. Like you you could yell at him. He'd yell back at you, and he'd be right in your face. And then four seconds later, it would be like, oh yeah, where's a good spot to eat? You know what I mean? Like you know what I mean? Like you just kind of knew. You had that respect, and and I'm not saying there's that they don't have respect now. There's I'm saying. You just don't know them as much as, like Dave said, it, it's nice to see guys as human beings and they would come up, you know, at a restaurant and introduce themselves. Because on the ice, it's such a, I don't want to say it's like wrestling, you know, WW, whatever it is, E, but it's, you know, it's your job. And, and the last thing you want to do is, you know, be nice and introduce yourself to someone, right? You know what I mean? It's not like you're out there, you're competing, you're, you're doing your job and so are they, so... It's not unlike a reality TV show where the contestants eliminate each other. Yeah. If you're an asshole all the time, that's it. <laughs> you're getting voted off. They're gonna that's yeah. It. They're gonna be like, you're an odious personality. I don't want to be around you. Yeah. Please leave. Yep. Yeah. Uh, NHL officials are gonna be like, Miko Ranton and sh shut up. Stop yeah. talking. To me. Just <laughs> stop screaming at me. And you saw the difference between Ranton and last year, where he yeah. was screaming constantly, yep. to this year where. There's some of it, it felt but like it's a not normal amount egregious. of, of yeah. discontent. It's Nathan with, McKinnon getting the unsportsman likes this year. <laughs> yeah, like it. It feels like a, okay. Hey, they've kind of drawn their line in the sand with you guys whine a lot. Yeah, please stop this. <laughs> um, you build those better relationships. This is one area where I do think they miss Landis Cog. The, I the 100 captain, 100 agree. Yeah. The leadership, the 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 adult in the room to go over there and be like, hey, my guys are just fighting. For their, you know, for themselves, they're advocating yeah. for themselves. Please stop doing this to us. Yeah. Yep. And instead, you have Nathan McKinnon just you know, screaming at people. It's, it's a different approach. <laughs> Got to have a tender touch on occasion. At yeah, least. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. The tender touch has has been a little lacking for the Avs this year in that yeah. department. 
And they still lead the league in penalties drawn. So <laughs> what are you going to do? Because they're fast. Yeah, of course. Because it turns out most penalties are, in fact, penalties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they get it right. Uh, all right. That's all I got. Any any final thoughts you guys want to end? There was a there was a question in chat uh, um, asked to Eric about bulletin board material. Um, how often do players read it? I'm curious your answer, and then I'll add something on at the end. Oh, huge. I mean, that's... I. I I mean, if I was working for a team today, like it'd be like, again, I have a son that plays highly competitive hockey, and I always bring it up, you know, no built-in board material. Like, you know what I mean? If you're asked to do something, you just always respect and don't have a slippage. And I do believe it exists, and I've seen it. Um, so you mean it's a bad idea the day before the national championship game to say <laughs> there's going to be a lot of tears no, the from morning, the other side? Uh, the morning, right there before the game. Yeah. Before the game, I'm that sorry. That was right before the game. Yeah, Not great, Bob. I'm just saying. I just, Not I understand it's, it's great for entertainment and everything. But at the end of the day, like, you, you don't want to be that guy because it's a team game. It's not tennis. It's not golf. It's a team game. So you don't want to be the guy that's drawing attention for no reason or fueling something else. So, I mean, I go back here, Avalanche, and you know what I mean? Like, I, I always go back to the Ronick thing when he's telling Patty Wad that, you know, he undressed him with his jock strap and then, you know, and while I was ready the next morning, if you remember the, you know, the line yeah, about, of course. of course, and it's all rehearsed and it's not on the spot. Are you kidding me? But it's like, okay, here we go. We have him now. Let's get back. You know, let's answer him. And you, know, you just kind of get like, you don't want to be, you don't want to be that guy that brings that to, to your teammates. You know, if, if it was a single game, like, yeah, sorry, a single sport game, then so be it. Say whatever you want. Like Brooks, Brooks in PGA, you know, whatever, or live golf. You know what I mean? Like, he, you know, he'll just kind of, he doesn't care. He'll say stuff. Who cares? You can go back it up. You're on your own. But when you're on a team sport, I just, well, uh, I hated it when guys did that. You know. What about news outlets, Eric? Let me ask you that. I'm sure many of our chat have seen it, and I'm not going to name any names, but things easy like opponent. saying the Avs are the easiest opponent yeah, in the I saw playoffs. Too. Yeah, and then yeah. you know me. I'm, trust me. I have these not guys seen are this. smart. What is this? I'm not. Some, some, yeah. Sure, yeah. What is this? <laughs> Well, that's kind of that's what I thought. Chat was, you know, asking that, me about. I think like, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. What that's asking you about. I don't. I mean, I, for me, it's like really because you Why do. Why would see this stuff. be the team that you would try and poke the bear? I don't know. A weird. So, so a that's the easiest opponent. Choice. So when we talk about news outlets, while Tiff looks for this, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will tell you, I went into the Avalanche locker room the day before they. Uh, Went to Calgary. Sorry to bring this up for you, but got smoked the day before that series started. And I asked Alex Kerfoot, "What? Yeah, <laughs> are you for real? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like the easiest. Okay. Yeah, anyway, that's, whatever. <laughs> but um, that's what I'm saying. Like, like I, I talked to Alex Kerfoot and I asked him. I said, "How much do you guys like? How much confidence do you have?" And he was like, "I saw your pick. Yeah, 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 yeah." And he was like, "Most of us in here." No, what you guys think uh, how the, the this series is going to go, and I can tell you we have confidence in ourselves, and they kind of dunked on the flame. Sorry, I know oh, this is a, it was not even close. Yeah, <laughs> not even game the series, one. The series game was honestly one wasn't close. The score it, was in favor of the Flames, but it wasn't close. Yeah, it was. It was a shit kicking. Yeah, that series got worse as it went on. The it series, sure or the, the scores were closer than they should have been. Oh, buddy, it was like. But I remember Bill Peters coming in after Game Three, and being like, "The we're shots in were trouble. what? Yeah, because <laughs> it was like ninety to fifty or something, yeah. and he was like, what? <laughs> and he didn't have any answers for it. But I remember talking to Alex Kerfoot, and he was like, "We've read all this." He was like, "I saw what you picked," mm -hmm. and I was like, "Okay, I mean." <laughs> Damn, man. <laughs> I know. This is a little... All right. And, and guys then, will say, oh, the outside noise, we don't pay attention. Buddy. It was, you do. You, they you didn't lie to me that hear. time. They were like, we know what's up. Yeah. We know that you guys think that we're going home. Yeah. And he, he told me, he was, we have confidence. And they won that series handily. It kind of started this entire yeah. era of Avalanche. That's right. All right. Uh, we do got to get out of here. We have a lot more work to do today recording a bunch of our playoff previews. So if you want our abs predictions, you have to wait for that video, which is coming out later this week. Uh, tune into those on the YouTube channel when they go live uh, for this one. We appreciate y'all and we will talk to you tomorrow.
Like the mayor, 